very much. Uh, thank, uh, let me share okay. my slides. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, many thanks for the invitation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for spending uh, your, your Thursday night with us. Um, today, I will be talking to you about work that we have been doing uh, for the past few years on the problem of, uh, of waveform design. And specifically, um, I will be looking at the problem of uh, waveform design for next generation wireless networks. Um, but before I go and dive into uh, the research problems and challenges, let me introduce a bit uh, our Center for Connected Autonomy and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, this is a relatively new center uh, that's uh, initiative uh, that started uh, at FAU uh, about one year ago. Um, if you do not know where Florida Atlantic is, uh, we, are, we are 30 minutes north of Miami. Um, we are in the Boca Raton uh, main campus, uh, and the, the center is hosted under the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, we are rapidly growing uh, in terms of uh, faculty and student numbers, uh, as well as uh, support that we get for our research by federal agencies like uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, the Air Force Research Lab, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and others. Uh, these are the three pillars upon uh, which our center's vision is built. Um, the objective of the center is to create the future of networked artificial intelligence and connected autonomous systems. Either these systems are swimming underwater, uh, they are at the sea surface, they are in the ground, in the air, or in space. And we believe that there are three main, main challenges uh, around uh, solving this, this particular uh, and building this, 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 this artificial intelligence systems, right? Uh, the first thing is, is connectivity. Uh, how do you connect uh, machines to other machines? Uh, and how do you, or maybe machines to humans? Uh, the second thing is how do you train these artificial intelligence systems? Uh, in the bottom, you see a collection of uh, a range of uh, autonomous systems that we, we have at the center from, you know, underwater robotics, uh, sea surface unmanned vehicles, uh, aerial drones, ground robots, uh, and others. And you also see uh, some of the wireless uh, platforms, programmable radios uh, that we use for, uh, for, for communications between these devices. Um, so once these devices are deployed in the field and collect data, it is very, it is important to, to characterize the quality of this data uh, that will be used eventually for training uh, their operations for, 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 for certain tasks, right? Um, and we have to do that, do that robustly uh, so that uh, we, do not, uh, we do not have unexpected results. Uh, and the third thing uh, that we are looking at, you know, once you have a trained AI system and a trained AI robot is uh, what is important is to 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 to, op, uh, to operate as it was trained, right? Um, so during operation, it is important to uh, to detect potential anomalies uh, that might be coming up. But without further ado, uh, the, the, the 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 purpose of the talk today is uh, is to, is uh, focusing on on really the first pillar of the center, which is which is around communications. Uh, to motivate uh, today's discussion, and I think uh, most of the, uh, of the group here is familiar with the challenges uh, around wireless connectivity today, um, over the past few years, uh, the, the amount of data that has been uh, in our airwaves has been, has been significantly increasing, right? Uh, and this is because of uh, Internet of Things devices uh, that, are, that are increasing day by day. Uh, but also uh, different applications uh, like, like video streaming uh, and others, right? Uh, most importantly, today's communication systems are not, are not only uh, carrying voice and video data, but they, are, they might be carrying critical data for uh, connecting machines with each other, right? At the same time, the spectrum, the amount of electromagnetic spectrum that has been free for, for all these devices to operate has been has been the same, hasn't been changing, right? Uh, so the demand for the electromagnetic spectrum use has been increasing uh, in an already congested environment. And there has been some solutions that have been proposed. One of them has been 
to uh, jump from licensed spectrum to unlicensed spectrum like Wi-Fi. Uh, another solution is to move higher in frequencies and use uh, millimeter wave frequencies, which can offer you multiple gigahertz of spectrum. And lately, uh, the, the, the academics and, 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 uh, and industry has been focusing on, on terahertz frequencies. So uh, beyond hundreds of gigahertz of millimeter wave spectrum, right? Uh, what the United States has been doing uh, to solve these challenges, uh, right? Uh, we have, uh, in US, we have the Federal Communications Commission with uh, AKA FCC. Uh, and they have been taking significant action to, to, to make additional spectrum available in different bands. Uh, in the higher frequencies, uh, they have been auctioning almost five gigahertz of spectrum. Uh, in the mid-range frequencies, uh, they have been auctioning smaller amounts of uh, bandwidth around 600 megahertz, around 2.5, 3.5, and 3.7 gigahertz. And in the low band, uh, they have been focusing on new techni techniques that can improve the utilization of the spectrum, right? Uh, in the unlicensed domain, uh, specifically for Wi-Fi, there has been new opportunities in the six gigahertz and above 95 gigahertz bands. Some of them are experimental. Uh, some of them uh, will be uh, rolling out products very soon. Now, what is the regulation to operate either in licensed or unlicensed frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this is a, a graph that shows uh, the, 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 current, uh, the current state uh, of, of, of licensing. Uh, in the uh, unlicensing domain uh, for Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, uh, you, you can have completely uh, shared access between different devices. Now in the licensed domain, uh, there are different levels of, of licensing that uh, that might have requirements about the power of your devices if these are operating indoors or if they are operating outdoors uh, they might have uh, there might be certain you know coordination that has to be done with other users of the spectrum uh, so that you avoid interfering with them uh, some of these users might be uh, federal government users like radars uh, and other uh, other important infrastructure so it is important not to uh, not to create catastrophic interference uh, when you are uh, operating in these frequencies and so on. Now, what what's the regulations above uh, 275 gigahertz? Um, there aren't any actually, right? So uh, our scientists uh, are using telescopes and other types of infrastructure uh, and to monitor the entire spectrum. Uh, but only, uh, only, only a portion of the spectrum, specifically from 8.3 kilohertz up to 275 gigahertz, is actually the one that is licensed and has certain regulations. Right. Uh, so moving beyond 275 gigahertz and moving towards the terahertz regime, it is important to to define new regulations uh, for operation so that we avoid interfering. Uh, with uh, with uh, scientific infrastructure, for example, uh, telescopes, radio telescopes. On top of uh, the IoT devices that are deployed, uh, we have a rapid growth in uh, devices such as satellite constellations, which I, I'm sure you are all aware. Uh, this is an example uh, of uh, the top uh, five operators of satellite constellations in the lower Earth orbit uh, that are used for communications uh, and the frequencies that these satellites are operating. Uh, we have increased airborne activity um, with, with many drones that are flying. Uh, we have new licensing from FCC to operate in higher frequencies above 24 and 95 gigahertz. Uh, therefore, we have increased amount of interference in, in, in certain bands, right? And it is important uh, to not only uh, maintain and enforce the regulations that exist in these bands, uh, but also make uh, the most out of the spectrum uh, that, that, that the devices are accessing, right? So conventionally, uh, some devices have a fixed amount in time or frequency or space that they can use. 
However, this is this is this is limiting their flexibility, especially when the amount of devices is increasing exponentially, right? And we end up having uh, congested uh, congested airwaves at the end. Uh, you might have noticed that when you went uh, to a mall or when you went uh, to, to 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 a football game, uh, when your uh, your connectivity rate is is dropping, uh, you know, from four G to to even three G, right? Uh, now, as you said, it's not only uh, it's not only human to human communication anymore. It's about connecting AI agents that might be deployed on the ground, in the air, or in space. And all these agents have to have to deal with a lot of challenges, right? Uh, they, this, these agents might be operating in in environments that uh, that the profile of interference is changing dynamically. Uh, we have widely varying mobility. If you consider that your agents are satellites that are orbiting Earth or they are drones, we have changing network topologies, right? Uh, you might have a swarm of drones, of 10 drones, and suddenly uh, another 10 drones come in and you, you now have a bigger swarm. Uh, at the same time, you have to protect uh, users uh, that are passively listening to the spectrum uh, from radio frequency interference. And in some cases, you have to uh, deal with heterogeneous technologies in the same band. For example, LTE and Wi-Fi. What's, the, what, what's our thesis for, for all spectrum shared access? Uh, our thesis is, 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 uh, is the following. Uh, we, we want to jointly treat the, the entire space-time frequency continuum as a single resource. Uh, and this is how we're going to do it. First, we want to, 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 to sense the entire spectrum, right? We want to build a map uh, of, of the activity uh, across space and time and frequencies. Uh, then we want to generate uh, spectrum insights out of this uh, map. Uh, we want to know the location of every source in that map, of every radio source in that map, uh, of every transmitter and every receiver. We want to know what type of modulation every uh, transmitter and receiver is using. Uh, and, and other and other things, right? Uh, and finally, uh, we want to control uh, how much interference are we generating to to our neighbors, right? Uh, these neighbors might be uh, legacy users that they are already having a license to operate in these frequencies, uh, or they might be uh, shared spectrum users that are just coming in using the spectrum for some amount of time, and then and then they, uh, they turn off, right? Uh, so traditionally, uh, the, the, the amount of spectrum that is allocated to it, its user, it's fixed, right? We want to change that, and we want to move to a completely dynamic spectrum access paradigm. And this is how we're gonna do that, right? Uh, in order to create that map, we need to collect uh, huge amounts of data and uh, have robust data analytic techniques. And for, Controlling the interference that we are generating uh, to, to, to other users of the spectrum, uh, we need new waveforms and novel uh, transceiver technology upon, upon which these waveforms are going to be implemented. And this is actually the main focus of the talk today. Uh, toy example here, uh, which might not be a very representative of, of, of the entire uh, next generation cellular network architecture out there, but I think it is important to uh, motivate the rest of the technical discussion. So consider that you have uh, a base station, uh, a cellular base station, uh, and you have these two legacy users that are communicating uh, at the same time and at the same frequency uh, with two other users, these two drones, uh, which are called the search spectrum users. This is how the spectrum uh, would look like. Uh, you would have some of the users allocating some amount of frequencies so for some amount of time for, let's say, sending uh, video data. Then there might be another session uh, that might be uh, using a different, different time slots, but uh, the same subset of frequencies. Uh, then you have another user with other that, that, that has his own sessions using maybe overlapping frequencies and overlapping time and so on, right? So I, eventually you want to end up 
squeezing as much spectrum uh, as, uh, as it is available out there in order to maximize uh, the amounts of bits per second per hertz per square meter potentially that you, you would be uh, using uh, from your devices. Now, how, how can you do that? Uh, how can you do that based on you know your basic uh, uh, communication systems engineering? Um, here I have the fundamentals behind waveform design, right? So consider that you have uh, a waveform called S of T. Uh, this waveform uh, is uh, essentially consisting of of your symbols that are carried by different different types of pulses. Uh, from your communication system sources, this, this, these pulses are pulse shaping filters, uh, like square root rate uh pulses, right? Uh, and then you, you decide uh, where to transmit in time and frequency uh, by, 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 tuning, by tuning these parameters, uh, parameters tau zero and, and n zero specifically in this situation, right? We are introducing uh, what we call all spectrum waveforms. Uh, so instead of your uh, pi of t uh, that we have in, in, in this situation here, we are introducing another type of digital coded waveform. Uh, we call this waveform psi of t here in terms of notation. Uh, and uh, consider now that you have uh, L coded repetitions of this basic waveform, right? So mathematically, uh, that would look like the following. This S of T will be the sum of S of L, Psi of ta, ta, T minus LTC. Uh, TC is the duration of your uh, basic pulse, which can be your square root trace cosine pulse. And S of L can be your code. Uh, that code can take values from a finite alphabet. Uh, and then you will use this waveform S of T to carry your symbols. Right? This symbol can be modulated as PPSK, uh, UPSK, whatever level of modulation you like. Uh, now, optimizing the number of repetitions, essentially the length of this, uh, of this waveform, allows you to trade off between how fast you are sending your symbols and how uh, interference avoiding uh, this waveform can be. Right. So the longer these codes, the higher the interference avoidance, but uh, the smaller the data rate, uh, the smaller the codes, the higher the data rate, but you are uh, more uh, less resilient to interference. This, I, ha I have just a general problem formulation here. This is gonna be the only math that I have for the rest of the presentation, uh, but I want to give you an idea about uh, why uh, and how do we design that, uh, that, that type of waveform? How do we design essentially our code? Uh, how long our code would be? And, and what type of alphabet, uh, uh, what, what type of uh, actually code are we gonna use? Um, so uh, this is the expression of the SINR at the receiver, the signal to interference plus noise ratio at the receiver. It's actually the maximum attainable SINR. So what we did here is uh, that we calculated uh, the, uh, this expression by, by, by calculating the output of the maximum SINR filter at the receiver, considering that your code here is taking values from a finite alphabet uh, alpha, right? Uh, a capital H here models the multipath channel propagation matrix. Uh, capital uh, uh, R uh, is an estimate of the disturbance that your receiver, in, in this case, your base station is, is, uh, is calculating. Uh, and uh, E max is the maximum amount of uh, energy that every, every user in our setup before can, can have, right? These are, these are our users here. Now, what we need to do is to periodically, uh, we need to solve this problem, uh, of course. Uh, we need, uh, we need to compute uh, the optimal pair of energy and code uh, at a rate that uh, is fast enough so that our channel doesn't change, right? And, uh, and, and this would become uh, outdated. And then the base station will feedback that optimal pair uh, back to every search spectrum user. 
That's the idea. Now, how, how can we solve that problem? Uh, this is actually a maximization of a quadratic over a, 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 a code that takes values from a complex alphabet. Uh, so we know the solution to that. The solution to that is actually the principal eigenvector of that matrix Q, uh, which is eight uh, R inverse eights. So all we need to do is just do the singular value decomposition of that matrix Q and then select the eigenvector that corresponds to the highest eigenvalue. And this is your, 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 your code S, right? However, we have communications here. So uh, we need to, our code to take values from a finite alphabet, right? Uh, and these are some examples of alphabets that we have considered over the past few years in our studies. Uh, we have considered binary alphabets. We have considered sparse binary alphabets. Uh, we have considered quaternary complex alphabets as well as sparse quaternary with variable amplitude. And you can, you can check the, the papers listed below for more information. I will uh, review some of the simulation and experimental results in the rest of the presentation about how uh, different, uh, different codes operate in terms of uh, SINR. So what I saw here uh, is actually on the y-axis uh, what is the SINR loss uh, when you are using uh, binary uh, codes uh, with respect to complex codes uh, for a code length of uh, 16, okay? Uh, the different uh, colors are uh, different algorithms. Uh, the red stars, uh, which are actually, uh, which is actually the performance of, of our proposed algorithm, uh, is, uh, uh, is actually uh, what I want you to, to, to look at. Um, I'll take a step back here and, and explain, uh, first of all, uh, how do we calculate this SINR performance? Uh, we can calculate uh, the, the, the optimal SINR, per, SINR performance by solving exhaustively uh, uh, the, and finding the code that maximizes that SINR, right? Uh, so if we have a binary code, we can, we can try all the possible two to the L combinations of the code that will maximize your SINR uh, and then calculate what would be the SINR if you had complex codes and then calculate what, what would be the SINR loss. Uh, now, the red, uh, the red uh, starred uh, line that I wanted to focus is actually a new algorithm that we proposed in one of the papers that I showed you before which, is, which can find, as you see, uh, the same performance code, uh, but uh, with a much lower complexity uh, than the complexity of doing exhaustive sets. Right, that's, that's all I want you to take from this slide. Uh, now I have some more simulation results that show the performance, the SINR performance that different types of codes achieve um, for different numbers of, 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 of users that are using the same, the same, the same channel uh, and the same frequencies. Uh, and uh, I'll move forward actually uh, for the sake of time to, to the experimental section. So apart from simulations, we wanted to evaluate how these codes uh, operate in a, in a, with real radios, with software defined programmable radios. So we set up in the lab two links uh, that you see on the left side of the figure, uh, a blue link and a red link. Uh, the blue link is our legacy link, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a link that is out there and we cannot control. Uh, the red link is the smart link. It's the, it's the one that we are actually able to control and we can adapt uh, the code uh, and the energy that, uh, that this link is using, right? Uh, these are some, uh, there are some uh, settings that are listed uh, in the second bullet. So we, both links are using BPSK modulation. They are operating at 2.485 gigahertz using square root rate cosine pulses. Uh, we consider binary uh, alphabet codes. And now uh, let me go uh, first on the, on the figure that you see in the middle of the slide. Uh, in the, in that figure, the blue link is considered to be a narrowband user, right? Uh, with, uh, let me see actually if I can somehow put a laser pointer. 
Um, anyway, so in the middle uh, slide, uh, you in the middle in the middle of the slide, you see the figure uh, well that shows the pre-detection SINR performance over time for uh, both the blue and the red link, uh, and you see what happens when uh, the red link starts adapting uh, its code and energy based on the interference that is sensing from the blue link, right? So with the triangles, uh, you see, and the blue line, you see the performance before adaptation. And uh, the circles uh, and the red line are showing the performance after you adapt the cognitive link, right? So when you adapt your cognitive link, you gain about 8 dB because you are optimizing the way that you are accessing the channel uh, in the presence of the blue link. And without doing anything at the blue link, because you are adapting just the red link, you also manage to improve the performance of the blue link by 18 dB. And this is, this is because you are essentially allowing the blue link to operate in the presence of less interference. Now, uh, the figure on the right shows what happens when both the blue and the red link are actually, uh, this, they are wideband uh, users uh, that, are, that are causing interference across the entire band. Uh, of course, the performance improvement that you get is, is less, uh, but it's still enough to, 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 to allow both users to coexist. Now, Beyond uh, doing this experiment in, in single hop links, we went and implemented that in a network with software defined radios actually. So back in 2017, uh, we did a deployment for uh, the Air Force uh, Research Laboratory in Rome, New York, uh, where we deployed uh, two networks side by side, a blue network and a red network. Uh, every network uh, was consisting of five nodes uh, there were two parallel sessions that were starting from the source nodes on the bottom of, of, that, of that polygon that you see on the right part of the slide, and they were delivered to the same common destination. Uh, one session was a video session, so source one was sending video to, to the destination, and source two was sending audio to that destination by hopping through these intermediate nodes. Uh, the purpose of this experiment was actually uh, to show that the red network, which is the smart network that, that actually can adapt uh, its, uh, its, uh, its communication waveforms, can, can coexist, but also it can avoid uh, any type of intentional interference that might happen at the physical layer or even at the network layer. Right? Uh, so there's something that I didn't tell you here. Apart from doing waveform design at the physical layer, we are jointly optimizing how uh, our nodes are selecting routes, right? Uh, I will not get into the details of this, uh, but feel free to go and read, read the paper that is cited on the bottom of this slide. Um, so let me jump into the, the, the three different scenarios that we tested. The first scenario uh, considers that both networks are running on static waveforms and static routes. Um, we have collocated transmissions at the same frequency at the same time. So both networks are essentially creating uh, interference with each other. Uh, and then we switch on, we switch on uh, the intelligence mode on the red network. And we now can smartly select waveforms and we can dynamically route packets uh, based on uh, the backlogs uh, at every node. This, uh, this figure here shows you, uh, the first figure shows you uh, the aggregate queue size on the intermediate nodes uh, on the network over time. Uh, and with, uh, when the coexistence mode is off, you will see that uh, one uh, intermediate node is actually uh, getting a lot of traffic uh, up, to, up to 80 packets, right? Uh, so and, and, get, and gets saturated. Now, when we switch the coexistence mode on, you see, the, you see that the performance is getting balanced uh, in the intermediate nodes, and you have an aggregate queue size of about uh, 10 to 20 packets. 
And on the, on the bottom part of the slide, you see actually what's the end-to-end -end network throughput improvement that you, that you have both for the red network as well as for the blue network. I want to emphasize here that we do not do any change in the blue network, right? The only change that we do is in the red network. So by changing the waveforms in the route in the red network, we managed to improve 50% the performance of the base network and about 10% the, the, the performance of, of the red network. The second scenario considers uh, a net layer attack. So what we did is that we went and uh, injected um, intentionally, we flooded the queue of one of the intermediate nodes in the network. And you can see that actually uh, in that plot where at packet number, at time number, at time 45 seconds, we have injected about 1700 packets uh, in one of the queues of the, of the intermediate node. Uh, what's of interest here is that uh, the, the red network, uh, the smart network, the cognitive network, will dynamically route the packets uh, to uh, to the node that uh, that is that is that is not attacked uh, by uh, by this uh, by this net layer attack. Um, so it will sense that that the that the differential backlog gets increased, and it will reroute uh, the data uh, to the to the node that has uh, that has uh, that has a less less backlog essentially. Um, the performance improvement again here is uh, is is less. Um, we we get uh, about sixty percent uh, network throughput reduction for the blue network and about uh, twenty percent for for the red. Finally, uh, and most importantly, all these results are acquired without without changing any line of code in the network. Right, uh, all the logic has been. Uh, pre-configured in the in the in the programmable radios, so they have been deployed in the field, and then we 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 serially run all these experiments one after the other and recorded their performance. Uh, the final scenario was considering a drone uh, that was flying between uh, between so the source node and the intermediate node, as you see in the picture here, uh, and actually jamming uh, the link uh, by using a highly correlated waveform. Um, what I plot here is uh, the pre-detection SINR, the post-filtering SINR, uh, which is the metric that I showed you in the simulations before for the red link and the blue link. Um, for the blue link, uh, which is the link that cannot adapt to the jammer, uh, you see that the performance is dropping at about 5 dB. Uh, for the red network, which actually can dynamically read the interference that is created by that jammer and adapt around that, uh, you see that the performance, the SINR performance, uh, stays stays around 20 dB, and uh, the bottom plot shows again throughput reduction for that link, uh, not not network uh, reduction. Uh, where for the blue network, uh, you see that you have severe uh, degradation, uh, while the red network can actually withstand uh, this this jamming uh, that's that's caused by the drone. Now I'll, I'll switch gears, uh, and if I have, I think I'm good in time, uh, and uh, actually talk to you about, uh, about how we moved from processor only to processor FPGA uh, optimized uh, software defined radio systems. So all the experiments that I showed you before have considered actually implement, implementation of this way from design techniques uh, on the processor side of, of, of the software defined radio. So most of the links uh, that I showed you were uh, having, uh, you know, throughput performance uh, lim limitations uh, by the uh, by the implementation. Uh, so over the past few years, we have we have tried to work around that by moving certain critical functionalities uh, of 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 the waveform design inside uh, the programmable logic of the SDR. Um, so on the top here, uh, you see what the traditional SDR uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is made of. You have a processor that connects to an FPGA. Um, right, right now, we are, we are experimenting with uh, system-on-chip architectures that are actually uh, housing the, the programmable system and the programmable logic under the same chip. Um, 
try to move faster. Uh, these are the specifications of, of the SDRs that we have uh, been using. Uh, specifically, we have been using the, the multiprocessor uh, system on chip architecture by Zinc, by Xilinx, uh, interfaced with uh, an analog uh, devices uh, 9361 radio. Uh, this is a radio that has two transmit and two receive antennas. Uh, here are the specifications of the ADCs and DECs and uh, the transmit gain and noise figure. Uh, but let me get to the test bed. Uh, so this is uh, a test bed that considers only, again, a single link, uh, one TX antenna, one RX antenna, and one interferer. Um, here, the, uh, the objective is to show actually uh, how uh, resistant our link can be against uh, high power uh, interference. Uh, and uh, the second objective is to, sh to show that we can actually achieve, uh, achieve high throughputs and, and low latency on adapting our link in the presence of that interferer. Uh, these are the parameters of our test bed. Uh, again, the carrier frequency is at 2.485 gigahertz. Uh, we have much higher modulation rates at 64 quam. Um, we have done experiments with different code lengths uh, of 8 and 12. Um, we uh, have achieved link throughputs of uh, 5 and 10 megabits per second. Uh, the, the, the interferer bandwidths are 300, 600 kilohertz, 1.2 and 2.4 megahertz. Uh, and the code channel interferer power is 10 and 20 dB higher than the link of interest. Um, these are the scatter plots. Uh, some some instances of scatter plots where you see actually that trade-off between interference avoidance and, and data rate um, where we have uh, the performance for uh, you see that actually for l equals eight in the in the middle uh, our constellation gets completely destroyed by the interferer uh, on the green window uh, you see what happens when our link is ad dynamically adapting its code in the presence of an interferer. Uh, for length equals 12, you see that even in the presence of the interferer, the constellation is, is less noisy, uh, but of course the adaptation uh, helps, helps much more. Um, here are some uh, SINR performance results uh, over uh, a different amount of packets that we transmitted over that link. Uh, so for the first thousand packets, uh, we have the link operating in a normal mode, no interferer. Uh, then at packet number 1000, we turn interference on. Uh, and with the different lines, you see uh, you know, different, uh, different bandwidths for that interferer and different power levels. And then at packet number 2000, we, we, we switch on that adaptation mode and you see that in, there are cases that we can get uh, about 10 dB uh, performance improvement. Uh, and again, the, the, there are different bandwidths here and different code lengths that we have tested. Uh, that's, that's a very nice uh, figure that demonstrates actually uh, that agility uh, of, of our waveform in, in, the, in, uh, in the oscilloscope, in the, in the, in the, spe in the spectrum domain. Um, you see with uh, the orange color on the left, uh, this is the bandwidth of our link of interest. Uh, with the white color, you see uh, the bandwidth of the interferer, which is centered at the same frequency uh, with our with our link of interest. And on the right side of uh, on the right hand side of the slide, uh, you see what happens uh, when uh, we dynamically uh, adapt our link uh, over that uh, that interferer. Some ongoing work uh, uh, or that we have currently is actually focusing uh, on broadening uh, the waveform design by freeing the location of, of, the, of the code alphabet symbols in the signal space. Um, so we, we want to start optimizing the amplitudes of, our, the, amplitudes of the alphabet of our code, uh, as well as the angle at which uh, our, uh, our transmitter uh, will be uh, be informing to our receiver. Of course, this requires um, that the transmitter and the receiver are operating with, with an array uh, and not just a single antenna. Um, and I have for you some, some simulation ex and experimental results I would like to share. Uh, this is, uh, again, as I said, a preliminary work uh, early at, at an early stage, uh, but I've, I find it very interesting and I would like to share it with everybody 
in the call. Uh, so this is a simulation results that we get uh, in the presence of light interference. Uh, you, you see three lines. Uh, the orange line is for an arbitrary code and a given angle of arrival at the receiver. The blue uh, line is what happens when we optimize our code for a given angle of arrival. And the magenta line shows what happens when we jointly optimize the code and the angle of arrival. The experiment considers that we have codes of length four. Uh, we have eight antennas at uh, our receiver and the angle of arrival is at 70 degrees. We have uh, 16 interferers, uh, which is a combination of omnidirectional and directional uh, interferers that are using the same code length. So they are actually having the same bandwidth with us. Now, this is the performance when we start uh, populating our environment with much more in interferers. Uh, we have actually increased the interferers to 400. And you can see uh, how the joint optimization of the code and the angle of arrival uh, helps in terms of SNR. Okay. Then, most important uh, uh, observation, I think, is what happens when we increase the amount of interferers and we have some interferers that are near the angle of arrival of our uh, legitimate receiver. And you see that here actually is where the joint optimization of the code and the angle is what offers uh, better performance and actually might be of interest to, 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 to explore experimentally. Uh, finally, uh, this is an early implementation of uh, our directional links on a different uh, SDR. Uh, so we transition to uh, a Xilinx Zinc platform that has actually multiple channels uh, because we are interested of, of, of having an array both at the transmitter and at the receiver. Uh, this is an early implementation of uh, our codes uh, and our waveforms in the FPGA. Uh, we consider 16 QAM modulations, uh, code lengths of uh, four. Uh, we have much bigger bandwidth, uh, about 80 megahertz per channel, uh, and we achieve uh, throughputs of, of 60 megabits per second. Here are some details of the implementation. Um, this is the result that we are getting so far with uh, using that, the model of, of, of our FPGA implementation in, in MATLAB. Um, this doesn't consider any code optimization at this stage. It's just considering that you are doing receive informing only. Uh, on the left side, you see the spectrum of, of, of the user of interest in blue color and the spectrum of the interferer in, in red. Uh, and on the uh, upper row, you see what is, uh, what's actually happening when you match filter your, uh, your, 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 your receiver. Uh, and on the on the on the bottom row, you see what happens when you are actually placing a null at the angle of arrival of the interferer. Uh, again, these are results that are not considering any code optimization at this stage, uh, and it seems that you don't need any because the interference is is light. So to summarize, uh, there is opportunities for spectrum flexibility, which comes with big responsibilities for protecting existing users in the spectrum. Um, and that requires actually to, hol to treat holistically the space-time frequency continuum. Um, the ability to adapt and repeatedly optimize on the fly waveforms is, is critical uh, if you want to take advantage of any uh, point in space or time for, for spectrum access. Uh, and we have demonstrated uh, up to 60 megabit per second uh, systems that can rapidly react to interference uh, to maintain link connectivity. And finally, uh, the observation is that you might need joint code and angle of arrival optimization only in super heavy disturbance environment uh, near the angle of arrival of the signal of interest. Uh, with that, I'll close and I'll open up the floor for questions. And uh, pl please feel free if I have more, more questions to reach out to me via email. Uh, Feel free to visit our website and see other projects that we are working on. Uh, this is just only a glimpse of, uh, of our research. And again, thank you, Zeng, for the opportunity to present to the group today. Back to you. All right, thank you very much. This is a very exciting uh, talk. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not surprised the angle of vibe. I, I never thought of 
And anyway, I'll ask my question later. So first, sure. any any questions from the audience? Anyone? Oh, question? okay. Then yeah. Oh, question. Go ahead. Yes, question. Uh, excellent presentation, Doctor. Thank I, you. I really enjoyed it. The question I have for you is what sort of what one of the latter slides you showed that there was um, the 60 megahertz bandwidth and the interferer though was sort of stuck at his 20 um, megahertz uh, interfering yeah. right there, I believe. Um, now, if the interferer is um, monitoring his activity and, and noticing that you have now widened your bandwidth, what would happen if he widened his interfering bandwidth? Wouldn't that be put us back at square one again? Where we're um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, as I said, this is this is super early results uh, that are only showing uh, the receiver beam forming part. They are not showing any adaptation at the transmitter side. So it's essentially only doing interference mitigation at this point. And you are right. If if the interference uh, is is wider in bandwidth, uh, then and, and it's and it's and it's closer to the angle of arrival of the primary user, then you might not be able to avoid that interference. Right. The the only thing that you might be able to do is to change the position of the of the transmitter. Right. Yes. Uh, which which is which is actually what we are interested in evaluating in a in a robotic squad right if if that transmitter was a squad it was a, was a drone then you would have to move position to to avoid that interfere uh, so position change and uh code change might be important when you have very heavy interference near near your your your, your position essentially Correct. Now, I was very interested. Am I understanding correctly? The angle of arrival is based. Is that a beam forming? Is that equivalent or the same as a beam forming operation in the receiving? Uh, right. you're receiving. Okay. Right. 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 So the, the the top plot is showing much filter beam forming. The bottom plot is showing max SINR ML beam forming, where, where essentially you you read your disturbance and then you use that disturbance estimate to do your beam forming. Uh, the first, the first uh, plot on the on the top shows what happens when you just match filter with uh, with your array response vector, essentially. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so actually, the uh, previous uh, person asked the question I had regarding the uh, angle of arrival. So basically, uh, to, in order to interference your system, the, the 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 best the attackers has to use know your your code and also, uh, for example, at at or near the the, the, the transmitter. Exactly. Otherwise, uh, if if any of those are not not uh, lining up, then then you will be able to filter out right. or, or, or eliminate that inter interference. Right, uh, right. Okay, that's, that's but, very interesting. But yeah, there, there, there is no free lens, right? So, I mean, if uh, if you have such a heavy interference environment, uh, maybe you can't do anything else than just changing your position. Um, mm, yeah, that's right. So it's... We are, we are super interested at this point to actually go and implement that in in a, in a large scale platform like uh, for example we are looking into colosseum uh, which is that uh, big platform that allows you to simulate about 256 stadios um, so that 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 could be an example of where we could simulate heavy interference and evaluate how our code adaptation uh, method and angle of arrival can help Great. Uh, any other questions? Uh, by the way, I, I saw your implementations. You you, you are using uh, FPGA. So why why choose uh, FPGA? I mean, I, I saw some yeah. other people doing like DSP implementing things on DSP board. But why why you guys uh, use uh, FPGA? Yeah, very good question. I I went uh, a bit uh, fast on, over that. Uh, so. Most of the results I showed on the first part of the presentation were, were um, using uh, only the processor part of the SDR, uh, right? Uh, specifically, 
we were using uh, USRP end to um, and we were connecting uh, a computer through Ethernet. Uh, and all the implementation was in GNU Radio, the open source software uh, for, for, uh, for SDRs. Um, that, however, has been limiting us in terms of the bandwidth that we could use and in terms of the maximum data rates that we, we were able to achieve. So the, the alternative to that was to actually transition most of the computationally demanding operations to, to the FPGA, um, which although it requires a lot of, uh, you know, uh, heavy lifting in terms of coding uh, and debugging, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's much more tedious to, you know, uh, synthesize and debug uh, your code designs in an FPGA versus a processor. However, uh, I, th I think it is very rewarding in terms of the amount of, you know, uh, bandwidths and rates that you can achieve, especially when you want to move in in multi-channel implementations, like the one that I showed at the end, where it, where it, where you have uh, four or eight uh, uh, channels. Uh, also, uh, I didn't mention that because we don't have uh, where where at the very early stage of evaluating these methods in higher frequencies, where you have much larger bandwidths. Um, like like in the millimeter wave band, you 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 could achieve uh, one gigahertz or two gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth. Uh, so it would be super hard to process that having only a processor based um, implementation. Uh, so yeah, although it's super tedious, it's it's super rewarding, and there are high level synthesis tools out there. Uh, like uh, Simulink is currently offering. Uh, uh, you know, a, a model-based approach when you can you can start uh, simulating everything in MATLAB and Simulink, and then it will do the synthesis for you. Uh, but then you will have to go and you know get your hands dirty and do some very log debugging uh, so that you you are able to fit your design inside the FPGA. But at least you know it's it's easier than going straight and writing IP by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. That's yeah, good to know that. And also, another question is related to the your exper one of the experiment. You mentioned that you have a have you actually introduced a like a attacker, a, a broadcasting jamming um, signals. Right. So, what kind of jamming attack or what kind of signals are are used to yeah to do that? So the the idea of the jammer here was to actually give him the same frequency channel and the same bandwidth and actually the same code uh, with, oh. with, our, oh. with our link of interest. So it was okay. kind of um, an emulation of a, of a, of a very, uh, you know, very, very bad interference scenario uh, just to demonstrate how, uh, you know, can we avoid uh, such a case. Um, so yeah, it, it's not uh, it's not a frequency hopping or any any other of you know the state of the art jammers out there. It was essentially our own uh, implementation of a jammer. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm also surprised. Uh, I mean, the, your in, in the in your uh, work, uh, you don't need to. So the the legacy users are they, they don't need to do anything. But with your method, you, you can get a. Right. I saw the result. There's a significant uh, in improvement. That's right. very impressive. Right, right. So yeah, you don't need to do anything uh, to them. Uh, you are you are essentially giving them the space in 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 the spectrum to operate, right? Uh, and by doing that, uh, by jointly optimizing angles of arrival, now it becomes even more more interesting because you have that that space concept uh, in in the degrees of freedom for you to to optimize. So it's really, it's really interesting. Very good. Uh, have you thought about like any using any predictions or to like any yeah. on, on that line? That's yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we we have been thinking of uh, replacing essentially the optimization part of the waveform uh, with AI assisted techniques. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually ongoing work as well, where we are looking at uh, maybe an AI instantiation 
of 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 that approach for for optimizing the waveform uh but but not so much for prediction but more for um you know rapid adaptation uh mm -hmm. of our link uh yes. in terms of prediction uh you still need all the time your receiver to sense the disturbance and tell the transmitter where to where to where to to transmit right um mm -hmm. so but mm -hmm. it, but it's interesting it, it, it's interesting we we are also looking at you know uh, other types of you know ai assisted methods for modulation classification um that could potentially help uh, the link adapt faster uh, mm -hmm. but certainly yeah it's a, it's a, it's an open uh, open area for research i think to to see how can we use uh, channel prediction methods or or other ai methods mm -hmm. for that and also, how does the? Sorry, I will keep asking. Uh, no worries. Uh, how the? How does the code length affect your, in, of the performance? Right. So yeah, the code length is essentially uh, increasing your resilience uh, because uh, you you are essentially uh, adding your adding a gain, right? Adding a coding mm. gain to your uh, to your to your system uh which affects of course your data rate uh but if we're talking you know about uh millimeter wave systems that give you a lot of bandwidth uh then uh, even even a small code length of you know eight or 12 uh could give you resilience and still maintain your data rate at you know hundreds of megabits per second uh so it's a it's a trade-off it's a trade-off it's a trade-off on how to design your code and how do you select the length of your code uh if you are in in heavy interference scenarios or in light interference uh it's interesting to 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 to, to further explore that okay i see daniel has a, another question yes uh going back to the adversary that just pops up on the, the interferer that pops up on you and then uh prevents all um all communication at your current uh, code and transmissions how do you reestablish synchronization between the transmitter and receiver uh, assuming that they're having a bi-directional communication how do you reestablish that in the presence of the interferer right right so all you need to do uh, is to have a control channel uh, that is not affected by the interferer um, and this is this is what I haven't told you in this slide here that there is an out of band control channel which will give uh, back to the transmitter that new code that would allow the transmitter to avoid the jammer, right? So the, the, the receiver, the only thing that he needs to do is to calculate an, uh, an estimate of the, of the disturbance of, the, of, this, of this jammer, right? Mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in, in, in statistical means, uh, by calculating an autocorrelation matrix of the disturbance. Um, and then we'll have to calculate that new code uh, and eventually get that, that code to the transmitter and the transmitter will essentially uh, operate pseudo-orthogonal subspace of, of the interferer eventually. Well, that's now is that an architectural problem or is this just uh, an easily figured, uh, because the whole point is we're trying to establish communication, but if you need to transmit you can't tell the interferer please stop interfering for a moment while i transmit the code to my to my partner so we can continue our conversation that won't work in the real world will it no no you are not telling anything to the interferer uh, the interferer is out there uh doing whatever he has been doing uh what you need though is because this is an adaptive system you need you need to have a link between the receiver and the transmitter so that the receiver can tell the transmitter let's go let's go talk in that code instead of the code that we are currently at right now i understand the need for that that back channel but that's sort of the whole point isn't it isn't that that you don't have such a back channel when there's a presence of the interferer assuming the interferer is you know aggressively interfering and not going to give you any quarter for a back channel right yeah yeah that's 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 a that's a very good question we are actually in the process of Working uh, under under actually a grant from the Air Force to establish a secure control channel, an unjammable, unbreakable control channel. Actually, the control channel can be a data channel as well, right? So the control yeah. channel can can be on its own code, 
right? And it can be uh, dynamically optimizing that code to avoid that interference as well. However, you are, you are removing some degrees of freedom from your data link. Uh, so again, you have a trade-off, right? You, there is no freelance again. Uh, what about what about having the time based? I'm assuming that the transmitter and receiver would have some cooperation between them a priori. In other words, before the before before the bang, and they could decide. Okay, we synchronize our time, and should we lose communication, we will use our current time to generate a an agreed use a, as an algorithm to generate the agreed upon code book. Would that be a, a useful tactic or not? Not really practical. Not, yeah, not really practical because uh, you cannot find a code book that would always be uh, orthogonal to that to that interference that exists at that time in mm. your environment, right? Okay. So yes, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Except if you have you know an exhaustive uh, uh, code book, uh, but again, I don't. I I I I think still you know dy the dynamic aspect of you know locally sensing the disturbance and finding the optimal code for that particular disturbance is still a better a better solution. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Very good discussions. Uh, any other questions, guys? All right, uh, now it's uh, 8.10. Um, so I think that's, uh, let's, uh, let's call it a day. And thank you very much, uh, Professor George. Thank you. Uh, George, thank you very, very much for this uh, very exciting Thank you, thank you for, for the invitation, yeah. And again, uh, feel free everyone, in, if I haven't answered the question to email me, um, I would be happy to discuss this offline with anyone if that's interested um all right then i will stop the recording uh and like i said this recording will be available on the ny chapter website so you can i'll, I'll send you an email uh and notify about the this uh, awesome yeah okay <laughs>